start with how freaking great was that? That was awesome. Salute to us, Devon, for making such a great is that everybody got into it. Everybody opened up. Everybody talked about stuff. How many of you feel like you learned new shit about Cypress Hill tonight? Yeah. Now it's interesting that you nailed it, Stefan. You nailed it at the end when you said you don't know what you got until you look back. For all you guys, as you're watching this, right? Because you're in the midst of it. You're playing the 90,000, 100,000 people. You're not sitting there thinking about, oh yeah, this is what this is like. It's not until you get time to look back on it. So were there things in the film that surprised all you guys? Yeah, man, I forgot about a lot of that stuff. Actually, I was like, oh, shit, we did a lot of shit, man. <laughs> I, you know, as, as a young artist, you don't think about what's going to happen in the future. You're doing you right then and there in that moment. And we were just living. We were, we were you know, trying to do what we believed in. We believed in each other. And we just kept pushing forward. We didn't see any of the accolades or any of that. And uh, just looking back and seeing it now, I mean, it's fucking awesome. So, um, you know, thank you brothers for believing in me because, um, you know, where I was before we started this, um, I was on a path to nowhere. And these brothers, you know, had the belief in my writing and my abilities to come take me up off the street and, you know, rejoin and connect with this music. And it's been a special run with my family right here. But I think what's cool about it is it tells you through the film, you guys all went through that point where you have to believe in each other. And that's what makes a band last for, you know, what, 30, 40 years? Everybody went through that point. Yeah, everyone did go through that point. Um, but it's, it's the, the knowing that when I, when I stepped off for a little while, and I, I, they kept it going, you know what I mean? They kept the band moving, moving forward. And so when I decided, like, I got to get off my ass, the band was still there for me to rejoin. And if that hadn't happened, I, you know, there would be no Cypress Hill or whatever, but their, their insistence on not stopping, you know, is what lured me, part of the reason that lured me back in. And, and I want to give a lot of props to, to Eric Bobo and, and Esteban for that, because there was the time where it was three of us pushing the line and, and keeping, it, keeping it moving. And if it wasn't for, for that, yeah, we, you know, it would have been easy because, I mean, we've always been the underdogs. People were ready to count us out at any moment, you know, from album one to two and three. They were talking about, oh, well, they got lucky on the first album. You know, we'll see what happens on this next one. Next one's bigger than the, the first one. Oh, well, you know, the third one, they're probably going to fall off. And we just kept having to prove people wrong. And so, you know, having having the right team that were going to push with me to keep this thing alive. Because, you know, I think we all knew this This was special. It was special to us and special to our fans. So it was important that we kept it moving till our brothers came back. It was, uh, there was no uh, thinking about quitting, you know. Uh, there was no way that we were just going to let it, let it die. And we always, you know, pushed forward and we were just waiting for him to just say he was ready and we knew you were going to do it we know you were going to do it yeah. and praise God that right, you. You, that that right. Right. you better have yeah. you know I mean, something you just said though so interesting about how everyone kept waiting for you to fail I was thinking about this today music's a fucked up world it is there's a lot of shit but one thing that it gets right the longer you stick around the more people appreciate you. It's like at some point you sort of go over that hump where it's like you become Leonard Cohen, Nick Cave, and you know, you're Nick Cave playing the Shrine, and all of a sudden you're Nick Cave playing the Forum. And it seems like that time is now for you guys. I'm looking at all the coverage on this, and everyone's loving the documentary. I saw something that said, Variety said, this is going to make people look at you the same way that it sort of changed the way people looked at the Go Go's. And Belinda Carlisle told me directly, they weren't getting in the Rock Hall without this. So do you feel like as you're looking at all this stuff, that all of a sudden people are finally recognizing the fact that Cypress Hill literally fucking changed the game forever? It's a reintroduction, if you will. You know, and we don't give a fuck if we get in the hall or not. We never did any music for any of that. We did it for us and we did it for our fans. Yeah. So, you know. 
and, and, and it's validation for all the people that didn't believe in us. You know, I remember when they were clowning my voice. Oh, that voice is crazy, and oh, he's just rapping off beat, and I don't know. It don't sound like L.A. Well, we didn't need to sound like L.A. We are L.A. Yeah. Alright, you were saying, each of you guys, you don't really remember a lot. When you watch this film, what's the one thing, each one of you, that stands out when you watch this? And Esteban, let's start with you down at the end. You know, I love, love the intro of this where you're like, I'm busy. I got shit to do. I'll look at this stuff when I'm ready. If you don't look at those photos, there's no film. Yeah, for years, uh, I just had been doing, you know, I just kept busy the whole time, and I would go and take pictures and film, and and it, I would look at the film when it'd come back and be like, okay, cool, I got some good shots, and i put in those, you know, those file cabinets. And it's not until times like this where you're forced to look back and, and start editing stuff and picking out different photos and looking through everything that you realize how much you've really done and how many places you've gone, and and all the different shit that we've been through. Like, um, you know, for me, I don't know why my memory's not so good. I might have done a couple of things here and there to fuck my up. Yeah, you know, I had a motorcycle crash too, so. But the photos, like, take me there every single time, like like it was yesterday, so. And, and you know, the footage too. I have, like, 300 hours of footage of all different shit that, I've been filming since the early 90s till now, so it, it was, uh, it, you know, definitely hard to put five guys' lives that have been around the world together a few times over into 90 minutes. And, uh, you know, I want to thank everybody that helped me work on this movie, Pete and Georgia and, um, and Drew and everybody that, uh, you know, helped out with the, on the production side, you know, because, I mean, I... This movie went, it was, we, I think we got the thing like a year ago. When they told us, okay, yeah, we're going to do it. And uh, Sony and Mass Appeal and, um, and Showtime all agreed to, to make this thing happen. They're like, okay, go, we've got a year to put five guys' lives in an hour and a half. And, uh, you know, we were all gas, no brakes. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a challenge, but, you know, here we are. Yeah. And, and, and salute to Esteban's father for putting his camera in his hands on that person. Here we are, Pop. Without this, without that, none of this happens. So thank you, sir. But what was the one takeaway from you guys as you're watching? Because you're talking about like Woodstock '94, and you're in the midst of that. You don't know what the hell's happening. Then you look at that crowd, and you're like, "Holy shit!" It, it took me back to that moment. I was really nervous because, I mean, that that was like the biggest crowd we had seen in our in our career to that point. We didn't know we we get to other crowds like that eventually, but that was like it was like the mark. And then seeing all the people that that were jumping around to our music. I mean, you know, we didn't. We didn't really know that people were were connecting with us that way. And we got out there, and all the, and this ocean of people are are jumping to just our intro. It's not even a song. It's just like what we come out to. Then the songs happen, and they're jumping to that. I mean, that that was a surreal moment. And seeing that footage, that Alchemist, um, as a 14, 15 year old kid on Muggs' camera catching some of that. It, you know, it definitely brought me back to that moment. And I lost my shoes and socks that day. Uh, fortunately, you know, Send Dog had an extra pair of ten and a halfs, which did not feel good on my eleven and a half feet trying to squeeze in that. But, you know, I didn't have any shoes and socks. They peeled them off me when I jumped in the crowd. So, yeah, that part. You know, when we, when we met, man, I was 17, B was 16, Sam was like 19 and we wanted to make records and, you know, so we started making demos and stuff and I figured we'd probably sell about 100,000 records when we got a record deal because our favorite groups were selling about 100,000 because the whole culture was still underground. And just to sit back and see that and was like, damn, it just kept going and going. And I think it was bigger than anything we, any one of us ever expected, you know what I mean? So to look at it and just put it all together and watch the timeline of it, it was kind of, it threw me back the first time I saw this.
Black, Black Sunday is when we really saw it, though. We, we had went off on tour for um, our first time in Europe because on the first album cycle, we didn't get there, just sort of like said in the documentary. And we were uh, calling home at the time and we'd connect with some of our friends. Man, we, we're going to these record stores and there's lines wrapped around the block for your album. And, you know, we couldn't believe that because, I mean, you know, we couldn't see it. But then we start seeing that album move up the chart, and we're the first hip hop group to have a number one album and a number three album in the top 200 charts at the same time. No one's, no one talks about things like that because we are the stoner group, but we made that shit happen. How freaking cool is it to have Cheech and Chong in your documentary? Because, dude, I've interviewed everyone. I still keep out interviewing those guys. I mean, you think about when your kids, you're watching Up and Smoke the first time, and now, you know, what, 40 years later, they're in your documentary talking about you? And by the way, before you answer that, when is there going to be the Cypress Hill Cheech and Chong stoner comedy? That would be awesome. I'll play Chong, the young Chong. <laughs> you know, wear that crazy man cleavage vest he used to wear and shit. You know what I'm saying? I could do it, man. They've embraced us in a way that we did not expect. I mean, we looked up to them. They were an inspiration to us um, as as entertainers, but also as, as advocates and activists. So, you know, them embracing us and working with us on a couple of albums, actually. And then, you know, getting to know Chong a little bit more and doing some of the cannabis industry things. I mean, he's, you know, he's been a mentor, a, good, a, a great friend, and... Uh, you know, I love the guy, and, and, and I love Cheech and Chong and what they've done for, for us here, because they influenced um, pretty much the hip-hop culture. And, like, you could go back to the 90s and listen to every album, and there's at least one Cheech and Chong reference there, especially after us. Mark that. <laughs> uh, so we're going to wrap up on this, but you talked in the documentary about the fact that High Times was a, a sort of, you know, milestone for you guys. Where does having your own documentary rank? Where's it rank once? The documentary. It's number fucking one, man. <laughs> yeah, right now it's number one. It's right. It's yeah. number one, man. Um, again, Esteban did his thing. No one else could have told the story the way he did. Yeah. yeah, it's it's crazy because you know, like he was saying. We were just living in the moment, but we all had camera. We all had a camera, and we all just documenting, documenting all this stuff. And not not for a thing of a documentary and stuff, but just to have it because everything was going so fast, it was like a blur. Plus, we were um, using things that kind of make your memory kind of kind of go a little bit more. You know, but you know. It's a good thing that we all are able to have this. And again, big ups to Esteban for putting this together. And uh, big ups to you. Thank you for saying, yo, man, why don't you come and play with us? Because I got a knife for talent. Gotta, what can I say? I know that things are going to work out. It's great. Thank you. Yeah. One of the cool yeah. things is, too, it talks so much about the relationship with the fans. So when you look out and see everybody watching this, What's the coolest thing that you guys can hear from fans about this documentary? What do you want people to know about Cypress Hill from this documentary? That's a great fucking question, man. Um, you got me. <laughs> uh, no, just the connection, you know, the connection that, that, that we have as brothers to our music and the connection that we have to our fans. They've held us up through new music and times that we didn't have music. I mean, they called us the Grateful Dead of Hip Hop for a long time because we were able to stand strong when we didn't have new music out there. And we have the best fans in the fucking game. And I want to thank all of you for that. And, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, our connection to our fans, that's everything. Cool, let's hear it again, Cypress Hill.